I'm Fran Sandinella Benjamin, and I want to welcome you to the Women in Pipeline panel. Um, I'm the Pipeline Manager at Zoic Studios and the founder of the Pipeline Conference. Today, we're ch chatting with Kelsey Hurley, Technical Supervisor at Walt Disney Animation. You can go ahead and turn your video on, Kelsey. Uh, Sarah Trapp, Pipeline TD at ILM, and Catalina Williams, Global Head of Pipeline at MPC. Um, Jen Goldfinch from The Foundry is our QA moderator. So just a little bit of logistics. If you guys have any questions, please put your questions in the Q&A in Whova, and Jen will collect them up to be answered at the end. Um, ladies, I'd like you to please introduce yourselves and tell us what inspired you or led you to Pipeline, and also who influenced you, support, sponsored you, and supported you on your journey. And I'm going to start. Um, just so you can get an example. Uh, I got interested in computers and VR because my dad worked as a flight simulator technician for Delta Airlines. And so I grew up um, on my weekends going to work with my dad and flying flight simulators after I did my homework. Um, when I was uh, in, early in my career, I worked at General Electric and my manager, Richard Parr, set a really good example. He was a huge influence on me. He made it a mission to hire all of the smart women he could find graduating from college. They joined General Electric. They all had fantastic careers and moved on into other divisions, departments, became managers. And that meant when I was working for him, if we needed anything, he knew he had a whole bunch of go-to people he could just ask and people were willing to help him out. Um, he was very supportive of our entire team when we had a great idea. He would give us the ability to just run with it and make it happen. And we got a lot done at GE. So I'm just going to go around the table and say, Sarah, uh, you know, what brought you to Pipeline? Uh, I actually found computer science really late. Um, I was convinced for a long time that I wanted to do forensic science because I had no computer science in high school and I liked science and murder <laughs> um, and it seemed like sort of the way I wanted to go and then I got to college and realized that I actually only liked chemistry because I had amazing teachers and it wasn't really the the thing for me um, and a lot of people in my life including my parents and professors I had encouraged me to try computer science and I took one class and was hooked um, and I didn't really figure out that I wanted to be in visual effects until my senior year of college um, I was working at the NSA the summer before and not really sure if that was the direction I wanted to go. And a mentor of mine in college suggested visual effects because he and I were uh, designing mobile apps together. And he was like, you like art, you're good at computer science, like this might be the way for you to go. And I was like, I had no idea that was an option. And I did a bunch of research and I, you know, did my internet deep dives and was like, yeah, this is absolutely where I want to be. Um, and after my senior year of college, I, inter I interned at ILM um, in our core pipeline group. Uh, and loved that experience. It was really awesome. Um, and my boss in that group really helped me figure out where I wanted to be, what department I wanted to be in. Um, and it was really, it was really the pipeline TD group that I was excited about because I like doing lots of different things and you know all the good stuff that comes with being a pipe TD, uh, working with artists and and getting to to learn all day every day. Um, so yeah, was there something else, Fran? No, that sounds oh, great. You. That's it. Perfect. Uh, that, that's it for this question. Uh, Kelsey, what about you? Uh, yeah, so I've always been interested in art and computers, and that kind of led me to going into computer science and computer graphics as a specialty. And I, I didn't quite know what I wanted to do until I actually had an internship at UPenn, and I was able to work in their research lab and attend SIGGRAPH for the first time. And that really opened my eyes to everything that was possible. And uh, from that moment on, I knew I wanted to be a technical director and wanted to work with artists because while I loved art, I was not good enough to be an artist. And so I wanted to be as close as I could without doing the art myself. Um, and yeah, I learned a lot that technical director at different companies means many different things. And the one at Disney, uh, we are the stewards of the pipeline. And that was really enticing for me. I'll admit that I am not a very good decision maker in my life and pipeline makes sense. Like there's rules, there's like 
ways things are supposed to happen. And so that is everything kind of made sense for me and I finally had it kind of click. And so, yeah, I've been working with the pipeline for the last 10 years and I love it and yeah. Kat? Okay, um, I was really lucky. My high school had a program called Troy Tech. That was the name of the high school. Um, so I was exposed from freshman year on to things I may have not found so quickly myself. Um, Freshman year, we were playing with breadboards um, and learning visual basic, you know, the real good stuff. Um, <laughs> took a couple of years of C++ as well. When it came time to choose a major, I really didn't have any female engineer role model at all. So I thought, oh, I'll do psychology. I mean, that's an interesting topic as well. But, I, you know, I didn't really let myself think, oh, what do I love? What am I good at? I just, I just couldn't really see myself in that type of role, even though I had a clear aptitude. Um, a couple of years into that major, it didn't really feel right. I wasn't too inspired. My grades weren't what they normally were. You know, I thought this isn't quite right. So I uh, started taking computer science classes um, midway through at USC, tested into that engineering school, which is a sub school. Um, that all went pretty well. Felt really great. I knew I was on the right track. Um, I was also lucky to have a professor who uh, taught an intro to computer graphics course. Uh, he also worked at DreamWorks. Uh, his name is Sati Raga Vachari. Um, I think he's uh, pretty well known in the industry. Um, so he encouraged his students to consider animation and VFX as an application of a computer science degree that we might not think about otherwise. Um, graduated in a neat recession, applied to jobs that I'm pretty glad I didn't get, to be totally honest with you. Um, <laughs> thought about his words uh, a couple years in, you know, took some courses at Nomen to learn how to drive a little bit and uh, was lucky enough to get an internship a couple months later. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to kind of open it up for discussion, but um, I'd like to know, like, what type of practices like what have you all experienced that help make you feel included and you know supported you in the things that you wanted to achieve what's what's been good at the various places that you've worked at that's helped you in your career I will I'll say at Disney um like I, especially when I started, we had something called studio department leaders. And so we had five leaders in my department and they definitely were so supportive of me and were my rock, I will say. Um, they gave me a ton of opportunities and let me dive deeper into things that I was interested in. And like everyone was interested in connecting, which was really amazing. Like feeling just like I found my people with my peers and with my leadership, like, I feel like I kind of entered a space I really never anticipated, to be honest. There's times even now where I'm kind of like, I'm still in school waiting to, you know, get a real job because it's not supposed to be fun, you know? So um, yeah, the people I'll say have been everything for me and my journey. And um, I really appreciate that a lot. Yeah second that, but at a different company. <laughs> um, I found that my, my boss, when I was an intern, who really helped me get the job that I have now, um, sorry, there's a garbage truck outside. I don't know if you can hear that. Um, <laughs> he, his influence on me was huge. And he also really helped me sort of figure out that it's like, it's okay if you don't want to do the first thing that you're doing. Like, it's okay if this is interesting, but you think something else is more interesting and really did his best to help me figure out what I wanted to be doing and what I liked about what I was doing, and what I didn't like to sort of figure out where I wanted to be. Um, and then once I got into to Pipeline TV, we're a pretty small team at ILM in San Francisco. There's usually between like seven to 10 of us. Um, and that team is really is really cohesive and they've all been really supportive and great. And I love working with them and helping me figure out, you know, I'm only a few years into this. I've been working at ILM, I think for almost four years um, and just trying to make sure that they, we mentor each other um, and also pointing out like, oh, you need to learn about this thing. Like you should really talk to this person. And, and because ILM is a global company, there's so many people to talk to and it can sometimes be really overwhelming to know like, who should I be going to, to learn about 
you know, whatever you want to learn about, or I'm interested in this, who do I talk to about it? Um, and I think the best thing, like Kelsey said, it's really, you know, it's about the team. Like the team is really supportive and having that support system and knowing that we're all in this together, um, I think is, has been the biggest thing for me. I would yeah. say all of that too. <laughs> That's, I'm glad we've all had such a nice experience. I mean, I was having trouble at first thinking like, yeah, how would I even describe it? Cause it's sort of coming up at MPC has been lovely. When I started, I work for MPC advertising in particular, when I started the software team was only a couple people, um, but various sort of heads of technology roles, which maybe focus a little more on the systems engineering side have been really great pals and uh, sources of support for me along the way. Um, also artists that I've sort of risen up in their careers at MPC with me have been some of uh, some of the greatest sources for that as well. Um, yeah, teamwork, exactly, exactly what y'all said. It, it really is the most key thing, like realizing that you're, you know, realizing and loving that you're part of a big, a big creature, <laughs> that, uh, you, you know, you can benefit everyone if you do your part. Cool. Um, so what have your workplaces consciously done to improve inclusivity and diversity? Are, are there initiatives at any of the places that you're working? Yeah, so I'm actually, as of uh, October of last year, um, one of the co-leads of Circuit, which is our employee resource group for people of underrepresented genders. Um, that includes women, non-binary folks, trans folks, anybody who is underrepresented in VFX because of their gender. Um, and we have been, and those, we have a bunch of other groups. We have one for LGBTQ folks and people of color um, and folks with disabilities. Um, and that really effort, I think, has really become a big deal and a big emphasis at ILM in the last year. Um, and we're working on a lot of things. <laughs> Part of that is just about community building and making sure people know that there are other people like them around, um, you know, especially in engineering. I think there are six female engineers in San Francisco at ILM. Um, there's not very many of us. Um, and it can sometimes feel really isolating um, and getting to know women and other folks who are in the same boat across departments and even across companies. You know, we work really closely with ILM X Lab and Lucasfilm and Lucas Animation um, and getting to have that connection and know that, you know, you're not alone and you can make friends and, um, and have that support system if you need people to talk to has been really huge. And we're also doing a lot of things sort of really st getting started on company-wide issues like interview training and things like that so that we can make sure that not only are we being inclusive to our, our folks internally and trying to make sure that they are supported and that they feel like they're getting what they need and have that, have a have a voice if they, if they need to have it and they can talk about the issues that they're facing, but also that we are being really intentional about hiring and making sure we are continuing to build a more diverse workforce. Um, which is a, a big a big problem to solve, but it's it's one we're we're sort of starting to tackle right now, which I'm really I'm really excited about. And I think the company, both Lucasfilm and sort of Disney at large, which we're also involved in, has been really supportive of that work. Um, we recently hired a diversity a director of diversity who's been really incredible in in really helping this get up and going and getting started and really having a voice at the company level and knowing that the executives are listening and care about the things that we care about. Um, which has been really huge and I think has given a lot of people, even in the beginning stages, just hope that this is happening and that it matters to other people, you know, just, you're not alone, right? Like, it's all about, all about teamwork on every level. <laughs> Kelsey, Kat, jump in. I'll say, Sarah said everything that I had on my mind. Uh, one thing I can say is, um, over the last like 10 years, there has been a really conscious effort in our hiring. And so we're actually at the point where we are about 50-50 male and female. Mm -hmm. We still need work on non-binary and more other underrepresented groups um, in inclusion for sure. Uh, but we are, we are moving forward. And so that part is really exciting. Um, but yeah, we just hired a I think director or VP of diversity and inclusion as well. And so uh, we're trying to take the same steps that Sarah has um, mentioned at ILM at Disney Animation too. We're also Kat? involved in the studios all together very recently, which is super exciting. Disney Animation mm -hmm. and ILM and Pixar have recently joined forces to try to make company-wide change, which I think is gonna be really exciting. 
Kat? Uh, similarly, over the last few years, um, we've been working on diversity in our hiring. Big, big thing. Um, our software team is pretty solidly female. Um, I can't remember the exact percentage. Um, you know, something I try to keep in mind when doing hires going forward. Um, the job never feels finished, of course. I mean, that number ebbs and flows as people depart mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, I think there's still a lot to be said for ensuring that there's a lot of female presence in our leadership, though. I don't, I don't see as many females making it to those levels. And, you know, I would never, I'm not, not pointing any fingers. I think that people need to uh, figure it out together, you know, how to, how do we empower women to make it to those types of roles more often, uh, sort of a, a challenge I have for people in roles like mine, but, you know, in a positive way, it's not, yeah. it, it, there are no, you know, obstacles I, at the company, I, it's just a mindfulness. I'm still waiting for the Oscars, especially the technical Oscars to start recognizing more women because women have been doing software and they've been working in pipeline in this industry since, you know, I mean, probably forever, but I mean, I was at Disney in the mid nineties and, you know, I was there and there were other women there and, and they're all amazing and, you know, have gone on to fantastic careers at different companies. So I'm still at Disney. Um, so we have a question from the audience. Uh, what would you like to see the most from your male or otherwise allies and colleagues in the industry to make the industry a more welcoming place for diversity? I think one of the big things is speaking up if you see something and checking in with your female colleagues about if, if things are bothering them. Um, not specifically in Pipeline, but a, a junior Creature DD friend of mine told me a story about um, she had been, someone had been getting, someone above her, a male colleague, had been getting notes on her shot um, and basically went back to that supervisor and was like, hey, like, this is not my work. You should be giving these notes to this person. This is her work. She is owning it. Like, I should not be involved in this process. Um, and that is a great example, I think, of allyship of if you see something and you're like, hey, maybe this is not the way this should be going, like speak up and also check in with that person, you know, be like, hey, I noticed that, you know, so and so was talking over you in the meeting today or something like, are you okay? Do you, can I help you in any way? Like, can we talk about, like, is there something you'd like me to do in the future? Um, because there are also, you know, some people really don't want other people, I guess, to to defend them in situations like that, but some people do. It really depends on the person, I think. And so it's really about checking in with your female colleagues. If you see things that seem bad or sexist or whatever it may be um, to see how they want to handle it. Um, and also on the side, you know, if you see somebody doing something and just check in with them and be like, hey, I noticed today that you like straight up talked over that person in the meeting. Like, that's not really cool. Like we're a team, you know, they were contributing um, because a lot of times it means more at this point in time coming from male colleagues than it does from the women that are being, you know, put down or whatever it might be. Um, but that support system is huge. Like having teammates that you feel like you can trust is really, I think the, the number one thing. And so being a teammate that women can trust is really great. Please do it. It's awesome. I think keeping a certain tone of professionalism is really important. I mean, it shouldn't have to be said. And I think it's really great um, that I'm good friends with so many of the people that I work with. I love that. It's definitely improved over the years. When I, when I first started out in the industry, there'd be certain tones in rooms I might be working in that, you know, were, were really pretty unacceptable. And I didn't have the confidence, that, confidence then to say, just stop. <laughs> you know, I don't know what you're trying to prove. Let's just be people in an office. And, you know, let's maybe talk about something else. Um, it's definitely been trending away from that. Um, but yeah, it, it would just be too easy to say to myself, oh no, it's okay. I'm cool. I've got this like, and just deal with it. Um, so I think, you know, just, uh, let's, let's not sort of try to try to test people in the room. <laughs> let's just sort of keep certain topics, uh, outside of the office. It's uh, pretty fun to be edgy, but <laughs> it's not, uh, it's not really needed. Save it for beer clock. Exactly. Get out, get out of the office walls and then let it fly. <laughs> Kelsey, do you I have think, anything to add? Uh, for me, I think the thing that we've seen shift a lot that I think we need to still improve at is the mindset, getting out of the mindset of like, that's just how it is. Um, or 
like so it, it ties into what Sarah said on speaking up but like I think that there are times when people don't even realize that they should be because yeah they saw it it happened it's not a big deal but these like kind of micro things add up a lot over time and so being conscious of it and keeping that open mind and honestly needing to re-educate yourself because five ten years even that was the normal and it is changing now and we are expected to speak up now and I think that more people need to be embracing that and leaning into it and when like women for this specific topic um like do go to people with issues or questions or something like listen and um don't don't have the reaction of yeah that's just how it is <laughs> yeah or Definitely. maybe even <laughs> it's your problem you have to deal with it it's like uh no it's everybody's problem yeah those days are over <laughs> yeah it, they're gone along with the martini lunches that people used to tell me about they went to in the 80s i never got to experience it but it sounded like fun but i i would not get any work done if i was doing that <laughs> Um, so what career advice would you give your 20 year old self? My 20 year old self was not that long ago. Um, but <laughs> it's okay. It was, it's pretty recent for me. So it's, it's hard to have the, the perspective, I think on my, on myself that I'll maybe have in 10 years. Um, but I think even, even not that long ago, I think a big, a big thing for me is just like, trust that, that you are allowed to be there um, and just like hold space for yourself and know that like they hired you because they think you can do this job and they know you can do this job. And like, that should be enough for you to be confident in yourself. Um, when I started out, I really struggled with feeling like I belonged there, especially because ILM is a place that a lot of people, it's like the dream for a lot of the people that work there. Mm -hmm. And it's my dream too, but it hasn't been my dream as long. And I think I spent a lot of time beating myself up for feeling like I wasn't good enough to be there or feeling like other people had really like, you know, worked their whole career to end up at ILM. And I was like, should I really be here? Like, is this really, you know, am I really good enough to be doing this with people who've worked for 20 years to be at this company? Um, and that's not a good thing to tell yourself and not something I should have been telling myself um, because it's important to get new people into places and have new voices and bring young people into companies. Um, and I, I wish I had realized that sooner because <laughs> I think when I, when I was able to tell myself like, no, it's okay that you're here. Like you're working hard and you're good at your job. and like, this is fine. But my whole perspective on it changed and I became a lot happier. And I think I'm a better, I'm better at my job being confident in my job um, because beating yourself up all the time is, isn't good for anybody. It's not good for you. It's not for, good for your teammates. It's not good for your work. Um, I think it's important to just try to try to know that you're there for a reason and you deserve to be there. And that's okay. I think, yeah, when I, I was 20, when I was struggling to figure out why <laughs> my major really wasn't working for me, maybe a little less than 20. Um, so I think the advice I'd give to myself is if it felt good, you know, like coding did in high school, it was probably for a reason. If you can't imagine yourself doing something, that's not a good enough reason to not try. You've really just got to try <laughs> things that uh, things that make you happy. <laughs> Don't be afraid of them. I mean, you might try and learn, oh, that was not for me. But <laughs> I mean, what a shame to not know. Um, I think another thing would just be, I mean, the very standard speak up. I'm still a big second guesser, like, oh, no, I don't want to. I don't want to embarrass myself. I don't want to, you know, I don't want something to come out the wrong way. But I mean, you know, that, that, that doesn't bring a lot of reward. <laughs> Sharing our thoughts, um, they're generally pretty darn valid. So uh, yeah, that's both advice to my 20 year old self and my 35 year old self. <laughs> um, for me, I'd say don't give up. Like it will click at some point. Like I will admit I struggled a bit at computer science when I was first starting. It, it took me a while to realize the computer was doing exactly what I told it to do and wasn't doing something else and fighting me. And so once I made that realization, everything kind of started to fall into place. Um, and then I struggled a lot with imposter syndrome and like even starting at Disney, like 
kind of what Sarah was saying, like, do I deserve to be here, that type of thing. And I think part of that too is make sure you're surrounding yourself with positive people because I know back in school and in the start of my career as well, I had people tell me I got opportunities because I was female, because I was pretty, because I had the right friends or any reason other than, hey, you're good at your job and you know what you're doing and you should be here. And I, I am definitely like an introvert. Those comments I spin on a lot and it definitely took a long time for me to move from that and have the confidence in myself that no, I know what I'm doing. I do deserve this and I love this work and don't let anyone take that away from you. Do we have any more questions, Jen? Is there anything else that you'd like to, uh, oh, uh, for those of you that lead teams, how do you find being a manager in pipeline technical teams? Any advice for women? And I would say this probably goes with, for others in the audience, any advice for them who want to become managers? Yeah, um, I mean, I think sort of it's really important to keep constant communication with everybody on the team. I, am, I manage a lot of people now and I, I, I you know, I, I try to keep in weekly. I mean, so often daily contact with absolutely everybody. Um, I, when I became a manager, one of my main criteria was that I was still going to be allowed to develop too. <laughs> um, so maybe that, you know, maybe sort of the extra time I'm putting in uh, to that sort of makes it feel a little bit bigger, but I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of sort of like checking in with absolutely everybody and <laughs> making sure that people feel heard, people have, you know, an outlet. Uh, the one-on-ones are one of the most key things. So people have a comfortable space and, you know, you really got to do as much as you can to think, like, how can I make this person feel safe talking to me both about professional goals, but also if there's something going wrong, um, you know, how, how can I, how can I create trust and, uh, you know, demonstrate empathy every step of the way. So, uh, yeah, I'm creating the type of culture that, uh, you know, that I want to work in. So it's a, it's a fun one. I really love it. And I agree with Kat, like that's, I, I find that the people that are like, Hey, I want to be a manager. Cause that's what makes sense. That's the next step in my career. Like, the the connection with the individuals and the people isn't there as much like it's it's not just the next step like you are taking people's careers in your hands and mm -hmm. it is your job to be like working with them mentoring them assuring they have what they need and it is there is so much people aspect and humans are so hard and so like if you're if you're going just for yeah that's the logical next thing like it, it's a much different job than coding. It's a much different job than like being on the floor. And similar to Kat, I will admit, I still ask to be on the floor too, because I find that it keeps me connected and that type of thing. And I can talk um, more with the people that I'm working with. Um, but I would, I would say also that every single person that you will manage is different and going to need something different. So there isn't a one size fits all um, at all. And everyone is going to need a little finesse. And so you have to be very, I think, open to changing your tactics with every single individual to make that connection and get the like, best work that you can out of both of you. Sarah? I mean, I don't manage people in a in a pipeline sense right now, um, mm -hmm. but I'm I'm sort of becoming a manager in the the employee resource group sense, um, which is a little different. Um, and so I'm taking this advice to heart, honestly, for for my future endeavors. Um, but I have been I've been trying to do the things that that Kat and Kelsey have both said because that's the advice I've gotten from other people, really about trying to make sure that people feel heard. Um, and I've I've mentored a number of interns even in my short tenure at ILM. And the thing that I always try to do with them is make sure that they know they can always come to me, even if they think it's a stupid question or they're, they're like, I don't know if this, if you're the right person to ask, I'm like, you can always ask me. And then if I don't know, I'll just ask somebody else. Um, and trying to be that conduit for them of like, 
I am, I am always going to try to answer your question, but if I can't, I probably know the person who can, and I can help make that connection. So you don't have to cold call somebody, um, which I know, especially for interns is terrifying. Cause I was one. <laughs> I know for me recently, I, I have discovered, I suppose that sometimes you really need to ask to say, I want to be a lead and I want to be the manager because even though it should be obvious, sometimes it just isn't and other people are also asking and if if you don't ask these people just figure oh you don't care that much and that may not be true um okay so another question uh, um how do we as the vfx community uh best inspire young adults especially young women to get excited about stem and science do you guys have ideas thoughts on that I think part of it is showing what's capable, like what jobs are even there. Like so many people watch movies or commercials or anything and they don't realize that that's a career path. Like it, the con like logically mm -hmm. I know like it has to be, someone has to be doing it, but it never even occurred to me. It was a direction I could go until after I was already in college. And I know that we want to start talking to people at honestly younger ages than that to get them inspired so they even want to go that direction when they get to college. Um, so I, I think we need to do more of just speaking out about what's even possible in our industry and different directions people can go and providing like honestly free resources and training on how people can start to even learn about these types of like uh, topics to see if they're even interested in them. Definitely. Sorry, Sarah and I unmuted at the same time. Um, I was going to say that, uh, yeah, the path to finding BFX software feels a little bit magical. <laughs> like I stumbled upon it. Um, and yeah, it, it, you know, a, sort of a sequence of random events got me here. Um, and I feel very lucky in that respect because I genuinely don't think I would enjoy just any old software job. <laughs> I really don't. I think it's such a sweet spot for having mm. fun and working on a team. And, you know, even if we're not contributing directly to the pixels, it's still such an exciting feeling. Like it's something I, something I care about. Um, yeah, I think, uh, making the time for outreach and mentorships um that that's a really big thing it's uh you know we, we all know we we need to do it i haven't done it quite as much as i would like to i'm uh doing one now shout out to rebecca um but uh yeah just you know we, we've we've got to be the examples we would have wanted yeah i agree wholeheartedly um, I wouldn't be here without the the wonderful mentorship of Rachel Rose, um, who's one of our uh, R&D supervisors, who took the time to sit down with me and talk to me about her job, um, you know, which she absolutely did not have to do. And it was part of, a big part of the reason that I applied to intern at ILM at all. Um, and I think that things like that, just like taking the time for people who reach out to you and also trying to do the reaching out so that people know they have a resource um, and being, you know, available, being like, hey, I might not respond to that email right away, but I will, you know, I'm going to get back to you and I will do my best and, you know, just making sure that you're available. And also that in doing outreach, you're presenting a wider range of faces um, because people are, even if they know that the job's not there, like Kat was saying, they're not going to do it if they can't see themselves doing it, right? Um, and not everyone is going to, is going to be able to have that important realization that Kat had <laughs> to just like do the thing that makes them happy. Um, for lots of people, that's really hard if they can't see themselves, you know, it's the, you got to see it to believe it sort of thing. And I think that that's really huge, um, both in age ranges and in gender and in race and all that stuff. Like we really need to be presenting the best versions of ourselves in order to be the best versions of ourselves and the best community that we can be, you know, I think that in my experience, the visual effects community has been really welcoming and totally interested in mentoring young people and sharing their knowledge. Um, and I think we just need to expand that a little bit outside of our circle, um, both with young people and also maybe with, you know, other professionals who don't know this is an option because um, those people have networks and those people have networks, you know, and it's a, it's really a, a trickle down effect, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so somebody said, speaking up is hard, learning how to navigate new reactions. Um, 
do any of you have leadership or um, training for that type of, you know, like for your positions? Like, you know, have you guys taken any classes? I've taken some internally provided classes that have been great. Um, only a couple. I have a long way to go. <laughs> Speaking up, still completely a thing for me uh, that I will keep working on. Um, but yeah, I've been provided great internal resources for that. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, reading the books that are out there on that kind of thing, on <laughs> sort of changing your mindset about uh, yeah, things related to re leadership, speaking up. Um, yeah, so they're, they're classics for a reason. We had a really good mentorship program um, back when we were still in the building. Um, and so that, that is one thing that I know that we've been kind of missing uh, the last, I guess, year and a half working from home. So it's something I hope gets started again. Um, and they, they had certain like uh, classes and like brought in speakers and that type of thing. And that was really, really useful. And um, there were books that were recommended and such. Um, I, I will say for speaking up too, uh, I think the biggest influence for me has been uh, one of the people I work with is very uh, candid and straightforward and kind of no BS kind of person. And I will say that's rubbed off on me a little bit in some of those situations. And so like a mixture of like gaining confidence and seeing like, hey, other people are able to do this. And honestly, they're saying the right things. Like it makes sense. Um, like, so actually just seeing others do it, um, I think helps like get more people doing it as well. And so it, it might take you being the first person, unfortunately, but then like it will create a community where people feel safe that they can. Okay. I'm a pretty extroverted person. Um, and so I'm trying to do that thing that Kelsey is talking about of trying to trying to lead by example and be like, I, if I can speak up in this meeting and I can you know, share my opinions on things that are hard, then so can other people. It's also some of the stuff we're working on with our employee resource groups of trying to make sure that we have public speaking training specifically like presentation speaking. And um, we happen to have a national debate champion who just joined the company um, like six months ago. So she's gonna lead that, which is super excited. Like we literally couldn't have a better person to spearhead that effort. Um, and the company also has lots of training. I think the bigger thing, one of the things for us is like making that accessible to people so they know it's out there because we have a lot of training and we have people who are really, really good at this stuff. Um, but it's just trying to make sure that everybody knows about it and has the opportunity to, to take those classes and to, to learn, you know, how to build their confidence. Um, so, but so, we're working on it. Sounds like, sounds like people should uh, check with their companies and if their companies don't have anything, you know, I'm going to seek, seek resources in the industry for suggestions. Uh, we're almost down to the wire. I wanted to ask, you know, with COVID, has that affected you personally, like with your life? Like, I know for me, I felt like I had more to manage, which I wasn't expecting, but I felt like I had to mo more to manage than my husband, you know, between work and home. How have you guys found this for yourselves? I think I've just lost all time boundaries. Other than that, it's okay. I mean, I need better sort of time management, uh, but also personal time really management habits. Like I need to do that morning walk, but you know, nothing, uh, nothing revolutionary to add there, but uh, mental health is, uh, is everything. And uh, take, taking time for yourself and getting moving uh, are important. I'm gonna stop talking because there's only a couple minutes. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have really struggled in COVID. I need the separation. I live in a small apartment in San Francisco. I have no workspace. I sit on my couch. Um, and that's been really, it's been really hard. I've been working on it. I'm still not great. All I want to do is sit in my office. Um, but I have also been, my partner had a weird schedule over COVID. And so I was home alone a lot of the time. Um, mm. And I found that both between the having no boundary from work and being alone a lot um, has affected me more, I think, than, than sort of regular work stuff. But that is getting better and on all fronts <laughs> and moving back towards some sort of normal schedule, um, which I think is going to help immensely. Kelsey, make it really, really quick because we got this really quick. Like, time. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, kind of just echoing. It was, it was hard. The interesting thing for me was since I was actually on Raya all last year, 
I had like a goal and it was ending in December. So I'm like, okay, I just got to keep going. So I'll say, actually, I'm trying to find my balance now and I'm still in the process there. I feel about a year behind from everybody for that. Um, it, it helped being just very, very busy all the time. Great. This has been a great discussion, ladies. I've very much enjoyed it. Um, I want to say thank you very much for everyone to come to our session. Up next at 1240, which is now, is FIRA Portable Real-Time Rig Deformation. So head on over to the next session, and thank you for coming.